In our world today, there's an epidemic of anxiety. There's so much coming against us, and for many, it's causing not just worry, but an overwhelming and frightening state of panic. There are keys to dealing with this, and I wanna help you use God's Word to fight and win the battle for inner peace. My book, The Answer to Anxiety, will help you through the process of eliminating tormenting thoughts and replacing them with the peace that passes all understanding. Joyce Meyer's The Answer to Anxiety. Order now. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Strife, if you look up the definition, is bickering, arguing, heated, heated disagreement, and an angry undercurrent. And that angry undercurrent is the dangerous part of strife. That's like maybe, say, at church. And I can remember doing this. I can well remember going to church with my friends, and on Sundays we would go out and eat breakfast after church, and we would have the pastor for lunch. <laughs> and enjoyed it. I didn't know any better then. I was going to church, but I wasn't living for God. And I actually believed that I was born again. I just didn't know anything. And you know, no matter how born again you are, if you don't know anything, people perish for a lack of knowledge. That's why it's important for you to read good books and hear good, anointed, truthful preaching the Bible says in the last days that people will have itching ears and they will search around until they find somebody that's saying what they want to hear, not necessarily what they need to hear. And so as a minister, I'm committed, and if there are any other teachers here who teach the Bible, we must be committed to saying what God wants us to say, not what people want to hear. Amen? And you might ruffle somebody's feathers once in a while, but I would much rather you not like me for a while than for God not to approve of what I'm preaching as his representative. Amen. Amen? We are living in very dangerous times, and the Bible tells us very plainly what it's going to be like, and it is. Just exactly what the Bible says in Timothy, that's exactly what's going on right now. And one of the signs of the end times in Matthew 24 is that many people will be offended and fall away. And the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of all the multiplied wickedness and lawlessness in the land. So we have to keep our mind and our focus on what God wants us to do, not what's going on in the world. But that angry undercurrent of strife is the thing that is so dangerous. And it's, let's just say, for example, you go to a church, maybe you're part of the worship team, uh, but there's somebody that doesn't like the worship leader. They think they've got a better voice than the worship leader. And so they're like, they say to somebody, well, she couldn't sing her way out of a paper bag. <laughs> and then if somebody bites on that, and they add a little to it, and then they tell somebody else, and they add a little bit to it, and then every person that you tell it to, it grows a little bit and gets a little bit more distorted. But everybody's acting like everything's fine. That is so dangerous. Go and tell somebody that you love them with the love of the Lord. And you know what we do? Because I've done this. You head towards somebody you don't like, and you turn around and go in another direction. Come on, we go to church with people we're mad at all the time. And we have to stop the anger, value peace, humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and wait on him to exalt us and lift us up. 
You don't have to try to prove that you're right. Jesus never one time tried to prove to anybody that he was right about anything. No matter what they said, he just said, well, whatever you think. So if you know who you are and you know whose you are, then you can save yourself a lot of time and energy not trying to convince everybody that you're okay. You know, you're, you're never free until you no longer need to impress people. Amen. So, this was my message for this weekend, and I've done this much, and I'm definitely not going to get this much done this afternoon. So, Father, I pray that you'll help me say the parts of this that are the most important for them to hear this afternoon, in Jesus' name. Now. Proverbs 17.1 says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. So, no matter what you have, you don't have anything if you don't have peace. Let me say it again. No matter what you have, no matter what I have, we don't have anything if we don't have peace. Peace is wonderful. I love the early hours in the morning. I get up early. I like to get up at 5 o'clock, get my coffee, go sit. I like to actually sit in the dark and just talk to Jesus. And sometimes I just sit there and I just love the quiet. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Mount up with wings as eagles. Run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. You're making a mistake if you don't spend quiet time with God. Amen. I said you're making a mistake if you don't spend quiet time with God. Amen. Amen. You don't always have to be talking. You don't always have to be doing something. Sometimes just to sit there and be quiet is like healing for your soul. We live in the midst of such a noisy world today. Always got to have something going on. TV's got to be on. Radio's got to be on. Got to have music on. <laughs> got to have our phone there. Goodness sakes, somebody might call us and the world would end if we weren't there to answer their call. <laughs> so we need to really value peace and we need to change whatever we need to change in order to have peace. And I made a decision, I guess now it's probably been 25 years ago, that well, I was going to have peace. I was just tired of it. I mean, I'd been fighting and arguing and trying to get my way and just arguing about silly stuff all my life. My dad sexually abused me, and so I started out angry and guilty. And the work that God has done in my life is nothing less than miraculous. And somebody asked me recently, what was the last miracle that you saw? And I said, you know what? We're mixed up about what miracles are. I think the greatest miracle, and I see it all the time, is God changing a person. Completely changing them. Now, my dad, my dad was abusive and he was mean it was just awful living in the house with him. And I don't have time to get into all that, but finally at the age of 83, he apologized to me for what he did to me when I was little, and I asked him if he wanted to be saved. And so Dave and I prayed with him, and he asked us to baptize him, which we did about 10 days later. And I can tell you that he had a filthy mouth. I mean, he cussed all the time and used bad language. I never heard him use a cuss word after that. Not once. That changed just like that. Now, he didn't have a lot of knowledge. So I'm not gonna say that he turned into this perfect guy, but he became sweeter. He became more tender-hearted, And I saw a definite change in him. And to me, watching God change a person 
is the greatest miracle that we can ever see. You know, Jesus said that you not only will do the works that I have done, but greater things than these will you do. And for a long time, I didn't understand that. It's like, how could anybody do anything greater than what Jesus did? And I certainly don't mean this in an attitude of pride at all, but what, what we're recording here this weekend is gonna go all over the world in 100 different languages. And so in one hour here, I will reach more people than Jesus reached in his whole life. And that's what he wants. He wants that. He left those 12 men to spread the gospel around the world. And we are God's representatives, and we need to just, if you just make a decision that you're just gonna, I'm not asking you to do any big thing. You don't have to start a big ministry. You don't have to preach to everybody at work. I'm just asking you to make a decision to get out in the world and just live the way that you're supposed to live as a Christian. Try being nice. Be sweet. Give people mercy. When people have a need, meet their need. Be encouraging. Be positive. Be different than the rest of the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the entire renewal of your mind. Learn to think like God thinks and talk the way he talks. And we never see Jesus ever lose his peace. When I first made my mind up many, many years ago that I was going to have peace, I kind of had to back into it. I had to start by paying attention to what caused me to lose my peace. And I found out, for example, you'll see some very practical things if you do this. Like, the next time you get upset, stop and ask yourself now, what really happened here? Like, I don't do well if I have to hurry a lot. If I let myself get in a position where I have to hurry a lot, or I've got too many things coming at me at one time, more than likely I'm gonna lose my peace. We've read several times that if you wanna have peace, you have to make an effort. God will do his part, but you have to do your part. We're gonna talk some this afternoon about gossip, jealousy, envy, and criticism some of the sins that I think we have allowed to become acceptable sins. Jealousy is on the top of the list. Anger, unforgiveness, probably, and I, you know, I'm just throwing out a number, but I've got a lot of years of experience, probably about 80% of Christians are mad at somebody. Yeah, wow. And you're looking at me like. <laughs> now here's the thing. You're never justified. You're never justified in unforgiveness. There is no justification for unforgiveness. You say, well, you don't know what they did to me. Doesn't matter. God says you forgive and he'll take care of the rest. But God cannot go to work in your behalf if you're going to be holding unforgiveness against someone. Now, forgiveness is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love is a decision about how you're gonna treat somebody. So the Bible says that you forgive and that may not mean that you feel any different about the person the next time you see them, but it's very plain. You make a decision to forgive, you pray for them, you bless and do not curse them, and to bless means to speak well of, and to curse means to speak evil of. So guess what? If you're gonna forgive somebody, you have to stop talking about them in an unkind way. Uh, your clapping's getting a little weaker this afternoon. 
We just so want to tell somebody what they, you just, we just want to tell what they did to us. And you're so much better off if you just pray and let God work. And one of the things that I think is more important than anything, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Now, that's not just talking about food and water. It basically means if he has a need, just imagine. I mean, I don't have time to tell you the whole story about my dad, but it, it was miraculous. God told us to take care of my parents until they died, and I'll tell you, that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. But it was also the most powerful thing that I ever did. There was probably nothing that I ever did that hurt the devil more than that. When you're good to somebody that has been bad to you and mistreated you, you just totally undo the devil. He just, he, he, he didn't know what to do with you. Walk in peace. Walk in love. Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. Make every effort, uh-oh, there's that word again. <laughs> Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. And I thought about whether or not I should read this scripture because... Sometimes these are the ones that are hard to explain. And be holy, because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Uh-oh. Where are we going to go with that? Well, first of all, when you're born again, you're made holy in your spirit. God, there's a legal side to our redemption and an experiential side. There's what Jesus did for us as a gift of his grace, like he made us right with God, but we may still not be acting right. He made us holy, but we may still not be living a holy life. So, in the Vines Greek Dictionary, which I love, it's a book about yea thick, and it says that holiness is sanctification, it's a gift of God, and the Holy Spirit is given to us to work out the process of holiness in our life little by little as time goes by. So God puts all these wonderful things in us in seed form and then thank God for the Holy Spirit. Oh my gosh, the wonderful Holy Spirit, a comforter a teacher, a helper. He convicts us of sin. I love that. He doesn't let me get by with anything. He convinces us of righteousness. What a gift it is that God cares enough about us not to leave us the way we are. He is going to mess in your life as long as you're breathing. And I would be more concerned if you were never bothered by anything you did than if you were. How many of you can tell on the inside when you're watching something on television you shouldn't be watching? So, do you turn it off or keep watching it? Yeah, I'm being quiet on purpose. I go through the same thing. You're interested in something. You want to see how it ends. So you start making excuses for things. And then you go ahead and do what you know you shouldn't do. Then what happens? All day tomorrow is ruined because now you feel guilty. I don't want to live like that anymore. I don't have to know how the movie ends. Just bye. Go into something else. I got to have peace. I don't want to waste a whole day feeling guilty because I had to see this one last thing. <laughs> okay, well, what is holiness? I don't want you to, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, does that mean I'm not going to go to heaven? 
Holiness means dedicated and consecrated to God. A holy person is a person devoted to the service of God and one who is morally and spiritually excellent. So, holiness obviously has to do with our behavior, but first and foremost, it has to do with your heart. Because until your heart is right, your behavior can never change. So when you get really committed to God, I mean totally committed, and see, really, that's kind of what happened in my life. I was born again when I was a kid, not by any fault of my parents, because they never took me anywhere, but I, I had a knowing that I needed to be saved. I don't even know how I knew that, but I had a praying grandfather, and he was probably praying for me. And I actually snuck off to church with some relatives when we were visiting them and my dad had gone out to get drunk, which he did as often as he possibly could. And I went to the altar that night and received Christ. But the devil lied to me after that. I, the first time I did something that I thought was wrong, he told me I lost my salvation and I never really had any kind of a relationship with God after that until I was an adult. But when I look back, I can see now the handprint of God all over my life and how even though I didn't understand what I had, he was taking care of me. It was one of the things that happened to me was when I was about nine years old, which was about the same time that I was born again, this determination came into me that I was gonna overcome what my dad was doing to me. And I remember laying in bed and thinking, someday I'm gonna do something great. And God puts that in you. God puts that on the inside of you. And then I went along a churchy person, rather legalistically religious, judging, criticizing, gossiping, doing, you know, all the things. I mean, I didn't go rob a grocery store or kill anybody, but I had a lot of acceptable sins in my life. And then in 1976, there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit around the world. Some people called it the charismatic movement. Some called it different things. I don't care what you call it. The Holy Spirit was touching people in every denomination and in every part of the world. And I was baptizing the Holy Spirit in my car. And I was crying out to God, something's wrong. There's got to be more than this. There has to be more to life than just, because I would just go to church and go home and nothing changed and go to church and go home and nothing changed. And it's not supposed to be like that. I didn't have a real hunger for God. I did love God, but I didn't love him with my whole heart. And I needed to make a much stronger commitment. And after God touched me, and you know, there's no point in even trying to explain what I mean by that. You just, if God touches you, you know it. It's just, people say, what happened? I don't know. God showed up. And I felt like I was drunk on love for about three days. People have different experiences, or you may have no experience, but I literally felt like I was drunk on love. And I wasn't a very loving person, so there was... Def, I mean, I even thought weeds were beautiful because God made them. <laughs> I remember I bowled on Friday nights. It was a Friday when that happened to me. And I remember one guy saying, Meyer, what's, what's with you tonight? I was acting different. Didn't even know I was acting different. And I wasn't bowling very good. And I wasn't used to hearing God talk to me. But now the Holy Spirit had come alive inside me, and I heard him say, why don't you ask me to help you bowl? And I thought, well, God don't care about my bowling. <laughs> and see, that's what makes an intimate relationship with God so beautiful, is you learn that he cares about every single thing that you do. Yeah. Everything. It's, 
The Holy Spirit was sent, the Bible says, to be in close fellowship with us. It's not about just going to church and going home and reading your chapter a day and saying a little five-minute prayer. Somebody says, are you born again? Well, I go to church. Well, big deal. I can sit in my garage and that doesn't make me a car. But after that touch from God, I mean, I got serious about my walk with God and I have been serious about it ever since. And when you get serious about your walk with God, you will begin to change. Getting a grip on those sins that we often let slide can make a major impact in our lives. And God can work through us in much bigger ways when we let go of anger and jealousy and being judgmental toward others. And it's not always easy to do. So do you need a little help? Well, Joyce has a resource right from the Word of God because that's where we get our help that can make a difference for you. The Managing Your Anger booklet is free all you have to do is ask for it right now. And it helps walk you through some really practical things when you feel that steam kind of working its way up. I'll tell you, God's word can help you deal with it. You can learn some very practical steps to take to release that steam before you blow your top and do something you wish you hadn't. So let us know right now that you would like to get that. And it's also available as a digital download, however you would like to get it. Thank you so much for being with us. We believe that God has something great for you today. Anger is not an if in our lives. It's a when. Heated situations can boil over and destroy us and our relationships. Before you let your feelings dictate your actions, read Joyce Meyer's free booklet, Managing Your Anger. Joyce shares where anger comes from and God's strategy for overcoming it so you can live in the freedom of self-control. Get your copy of Managing Anger today. Call 1-800-709-2895 or go to JoyceMeyer.org. It's also available as a free digital download through the Joyce Meyer Ministries app. Say no to strife in your life. The Joyce Meyer Conference is back. If you will start crying out to God on a regular basis, I need more of you in my life. You better put on your seatbelt and get ready for the ride of your life. Coming to Phoenix, Arizona, February 17th and 18th with worship by Dream City Worship. In Hampton, Virginia, April 21st and 22nd with worship by Matt Brock. For more information and a complete conference schedule, visit JoyceMeyer.org or call 1-866-C-JOYCE. Did you know that you can be completely honest with God? David in the Bible certainly was. He poured out his questions and pain and discovered how deeply God loved him through it all. You can too. That's why I'm so excited about this devotional, Daily Devotions from Psalms. As you take time to know God in a deeper way, you will find comfort and peace every single day. Daily Devotions from Psalms, new from Joyce Meyer. Order your copy today. We hope you have enjoyed today's program. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org to share your prayer requests or partner with us in sharing Christ and loving people all across the globe. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries.